Joe Sloan and Cortez Hankton officially are announced as co-OCs. Um, when they Tax when they had the hit, baby. When, yep. And when they announced it before the bowl game, we talked about that being a you know kind of a an audition for them to get that job. We talked about maybe other options. And then as it kind of unfolded and we saw the recruiting and we saw the guys that the recruits that stayed there and the recruits that they continue to get, it felt like those guys, keeping those guys in position was probably the best move for one that, you know, because one, they, they had a really good, they called a really good game in the bowl game. Uh, it feels like Nussmeyer is very comfortable with the offense that they have and all of the receivers, the continuity is there. Right, and then you have Joe Sloan who goes up there and gets the number one player in the country and yeah. the quarterback in the country, yep. and you bring him. So uh, there's a bunch of reasons why you felt like they needed to do it, and they made the deci- decision official. Uh, they both go OCs. Joe Sloan calls the plays. Hankton is the passing game coordinator and the uh, co-OC title. It's gonna be a collaborative effort. But here's Joe my question to y'all. Caller. Here's my question to y'all. How s- pre bowl game? How serious do you think? The, the, I guess the opportunity or the possibility of having co-OCs being named was before that bowl game performance? Like, do you um, think it was kind of juggled around? Do you think it was actually in favor? Like, where do you think that was? I think it was 50-50, to be honest with you. I think it was... That's such an easy answer. That's bullshit. Well, let me get there. <laughs> let me get there. I think that they announced it as co-OCs because they felt like it could work. Yeah. But they also wanted to see what the preparation was going to be like with both of them as co-OCs, what it was going to be like with one calling the plays and one on being on the field, right? All of yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know if they made the decision and said, okay, hey, this is definitely what we want to do. But I think they made the decision saying, okay, this is something that we would be comfortable doing if it works out. And, and there's continuity. That's kind of why I said it. What you got, Lloyd? What do you think? Um, this might not be the hottest take in the world, oh, but weird. I think a lot of it has to do with maintaining both for as long as you can. I think you wanted to keep a Joe Sloan and a Cortez Sankton on your coaching staff. And we talked about this before the hirings. We had half of it, right? I believe where we thought it was just going to be him. Uh, Joe Sloan is the primary OC. And then that's where I brought up the idea of, well, does that, is that kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face with Cortez Sankton, whatever you could do with the co-OC thing and not really ruffle any feathers in the building because of how well they've recruited. And it gives Cortez Sankton an opportunity to go somewhere else to be an offensive coordinator. Now, that situation still exists as you could be a lone OC, right? But I feel like this is the best way to keep both of your probably best position coaches on the staff for as long as possible. Well, and you have, you've had so much turnover, right, with coaching, right. with the coaches over the last four years. I didn't think they years. were going to go out so the building. I'm, I'm going to – I just – what did you think? I, I don't. I, I'll get to that point, but to the point that Lloyd just made, I am, uh, I am about as far from believing that that was the reason as possible. Simply because, like, I mean, look at the landscape of football these days, especially in this conference, especially at the next level. If you're young and your offense balls, you don't keep coaches. I don't care where they are, right? Like, I don't think that's the thing at all. So, I, I, I really don't think that it's a. Let's see how long or how long we can keep them here because let's, let's be honest. If they go out and play well, right. you're crazy if you think other schools in the conference ain't going to come after one or, two, one or both of them, right? Like that's the thing. So I don't think we're going to sit here and say like, hey, we can keep them both happy. We can keep them both here. It ain't going to happen. Like, no, I, the, the reason I brought it up is because it's tied into the recruiting class that they have coming in. I feel like if they can keep them for one to two more years as co-OCs or offensive coordinators, they're trying to get Underwood into the building. I say, yeah, I get, think they're 100%. I think they're trying to get Underwood into the building. But like, if you, what, what, what like, what happens if Hankton doesn't get the co this year? Does he take another receiver's right. job? So like, there isn't much. I, I don't think that there was probably much of a market for him to take a OC job somewhere. So keeping him here, keeping him happy. Yeah, I can see, but you also still know, like, if they do well, there's still a, there's probably a stronger chance that he leaves next year. That's and that's right. That, that, and, and, if, and if we're talking about getting mm-hmm. Underwood into the building, well, he still ain't here if Hankton leaves, right? So I'm like, I don't know how how much I really believe it's let's keep him in there as long as or keep them here as long as possible. I think it really came down to like we got the continuity rolling mm-hmm. and we saw it in action right. finally one time. So. I'm not – I don't know how real I thought it was probably before it, 
but I think it, I think it became really real after, and they just kind of kicked the tires and tried to figure out whatever they need to figure out to make sure this was the right move for them. But I think it really kind of caught some steam after the. Ball. And that's what we talked about, right? We talked about, oh, would you be okay with them hiring these guys? And after they had the best offense in the country, instead of going out there and saying, do you think they're the best guys for the job? Instead of going out there and just seeing who else is out there and who would want to come, because there's other guys that are more experienced and do all these types of things. And we said, I believe that if. Brian Kelly and the staff thinks that these guys are the best guys for the job. They don't care how much experience they have. They're going to hire them as the, in the, as the OCs, right? Like they think that, okay, these guys are, are right. They've done a really good job. They've earned it. If I feel like they're the best ones, I'm going to hire them. Not because of all the other reasons, but because I think they're the best. Like if, if Nuss goes 26 of 42 with two touchdowns and two picks, I think there was a less likely chance that this right. happens. Right, that, that, and that's what I was going to ask you all also. Is like, Even in a win. Right. Well, and that, and that was my next point of the whole thing, right, is I think in the preparation, like we talked about the audition, right? The on-field stuff was definitely a part of the on- audition. But I think the preparation leading up to the bowl game, game planning, <clears throat> understanding how you're going to attack the defense – understanding what you're going to do with the guys you have on your offense with the new quarterback and not having your number one receiver going to be out there all game, knowing that, how are you going to prepare and how are you going to execute it when the game comes, right? So I think the, the lead up was a big part of the audition. And then the, the, the audition itself, the actual on-field play, was kind of like the icing on the cake. All right, look, I, I liked what you did leading up to the game with the preparation, the game planning, and getting these guys ready to play. How are you going to be when it – when the lights are on and you have to call the play in the heat of the battle and shit happens quick and you may have some things go wrong and the game started off and you're down 14 nothing. what are you going to do? Well, we were down 14 nothing. We came back and it was the offense, I think, played better than anybody could have anticipated playing. And they said, okay, check, yeah. check, boom. Well, I, I'll be in. honest with you. I think, those, I think those boxes, the preparation boxes were checked before. Me too. Already. Meaning like oh, before the meaning ball. like I think they got the opportunity because they saw how they worked already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think it was really about what do you do when it is fourth and two, third and two, and you only got forty five seconds right. to call this play. Like you've never been right. in that in that situation at this level yet. I need to see that here before I make a move forward. Yeah. I think that was kind of what was needed to see and, and went way better than I think a lot of us uh, pretty much expected yeah. to go yeah there's a minute 50 left and then you got 98 yards to go what's your best play here like if they they answered that bell like you couldn't put a new offensive coordinator and probably a new quarterback new yeah. quarterback like all of that that they were served was such a tough situation to be able to succeed in which is why you almost have to put a lot of stock into it because yep. i don't think this is breaking news but garrett nussmeyer and jane daniels do not play the same brand of football right and so you had to prepare differently you had to try to figure out some semblance of a normal run game that you haven't had to really – Well, offensive line had to block differently because they understood that your guy wasn't going to run around. And yeah. so it becomes – I don't want to say easy to make that call, but with the transitions on the defensive side, it's almost like we have to have some sort of continuity on one end. But I'm wondering how this is going to play out because it feels like you – for all intents and purposes, you've won the press conference. Like nobody's upset about the hire. Right. Like everybody's more – I would say more than, more than happy to keep Sloan and Hankton. But we'll see how that goes next year. I'm just talking about the ridicule that could come when you have Garrett Nussbaum in his first year. You go up against USC, and it's like, okay, we have a totally new offense after you're the number one offense in the country. That's a big target to wear on your back after everything that was put out last year. With that said, you still have a little bit of deflection to do with everybody's going to be focused on the defense. Well, and here's the deal. No matter what, who you bring in. I wish there was a lot of question marks going into 2024. But no matter who you bring in to be the offensive coordinator, those questions were going to be – like that, that same pressure was going to be on whoever Yeah, that's why that, Denbrock that probably skedaddled. Like, I don't want to have to do no, this again. No, but I mean – I just you, got a major pay bump. Yeah, I mean, maybe. But, like, you bring a new guy in, it doesn't matter how much experience they have or not. They're, the first game of the season is with a new quarterback coming out after you had the number one offense in the country on the road against USC, like – what are you going to show me? What are you going to do? This is LSU football. You've been so, used to it. Yeah, so you're going to like that. No matter who is the offensive coordinator, you're going to have that 